I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken, so to speak. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast where we talk to the legends of bodybuilding and we also talk about the history of bodybuilding. I'm your host, John Hansen. So we've got another episode today where I'm going to read some old magazines. I got some um, Muscle Digest, which I haven't seen in a long time. I can't remember the last time I saw these magazines. It's got to be decades. And uh, I got the very first Muscle Digest when it started. For those of you not aware, Muscle Digest was a magazine started in the late 70s. It was kind of like uh, what Muscle Mag did. It was an alternative to Joe Weider's magazine and Bob Hoffman's magazine. You also had, of course, Dan Laurie with MTI, Muscle Training Illustrated. That, was, that one was been going on for a while. But uh, yeah, Muscle Digest was a brand new magazine. They kind of... Uh, we're kind of anti-weeder, I guess. Um, they had Cal Scalac as one of their main guys in the magazine, and they were really promoting Cal, especially after he left the IFBB. They did a lot with uh, Serge Nubre and the Wobble organization, but, but they also reported on the IFBB competitions as well. And uh, so I also got some old muscle mags, old ones like from the very beginning i had some of the very first ones when they started in 1974 and then all the way up through 77 78 79 80 81 all those great magazines but before the magazine got really really big if you were uh, reading muscle mag later when it was it was filled with ads and it was gigantic it was like over 300 pages these were much smaller magazines this is when bob kennedy was trying to just make it into the best magazine possible he was hiring photographers like Chris Lund. In the very beginning, they had guys like Larry Scott and Vince Gironda and even Arnold answering questions in the back. And based on uh, Arnold's answers, it seemed like it was really him answering. I know I've heard a lot that uh, with Wiener magazines, a lot of his articles were ghostwritten, but this one seemed like it was really him. So really, really great stuff. It's really fascinating going back and reading some of those old articles um, Bob Kennedy was actually kind of predicting that Arnold was going to go into the 1980 Olympia. And this is back in the early, early part of 1980, because they were supposed to film Conan that summer. And then Arnold was thinking about going into the Olympia if he had enough time. So what actually happened was Arnold did get in shape that summer because they were supposed to start filming scenes for Conan in October. And they actually delayed it until February of 81. So then after he was in shape, he decided to jump into the contest. All right, so let's get to these articles. I've got about five articles I want to read. So I know I read many articles, of course, about the 1980 Mr. Olympia, probably one of the most controversial Mr. Olympias ever. But a lot of those articles came from Joe Weider's magazine or from Iron Man magazine. So I wanted to read uh, some other takes on the 1980 Mr. Olympia and Muscle Digest reported on it. Um, I was surprised Muscle Mag really didn't have much of an article, but I know they did talk about it in their Muscle Mag annual. But Muscle Digest had this great article, and I've been looking for this article. I didn't have this magazine available. Okay, so what they did was they went around and they interviewed all these people that were at the contest. Joe Gold, Bill Pearl, plus all the competitors. Um, Franco, Dan Howard, and then they interviewed Arnold. They interviewed... Um, Boyer Co., Mike Menser, Frank Zane, Chris Dickerson, everybody. They got these short little interviews with everybody, and they put it all together in one article. So it's really fascinating. It's awesome. So I want to read that first. Then there's another one, and uh, this one also came from Muscle Digest. This was in April 1981. Uh, and then after that, Muscle Mag had a really big article about the 1981 Mr. Olympia, and this was written by Robert Kennedy himself, who owned Muscle Mag. So this is a really long article. I want to read about that. He's got a lot to say about that. And then there was another article in Muscle Digest about Franco's 1981 Mr. Olympia, written by uh, Kevin Campbell and Joe Tricoli, two guys. So who wrote this article? Let me try to find out. So this is from the December 1980 issue of Muscle Digest. This is right after the 1980 Olympia took place. And, oh, John Mead. 
John Mead was a great writer. I, I knew John personally, and uh, he wrote this article, Mr. Olympia, Arnold's Victory Shocks Bodybuilding. So uh, I believe John must have been the one to go out and uh, get these interviews. So great job. This was a fantastic article. I can't wait to share this with you guys. Okay, it says uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's stunning seventh Mr. Olympia victory in Sydney, Australia, has rocked bodybuilding's professional ranks and cast a pallor, a pallor of uncertainty over the future of the sport. Controversy abounds. On one side stands Arnold and his supporters, who are certain that Arnold was the clear-cut winner. On the other side stand the competitors and their backers, who adamantly state that Arnold was not the winner. And caught in the middle is the IFPB and how such a thing could happen to their main event. Since the contest was held in Australia, the truth is difficult to know, and the threats of lawsuits and countersuits draw an even darker veil over the already murky situation. Numerous questions have been raised, i.e., was Arnold deserving of the title? Why were several judges selected from the audience? Why doesn't the IFPB have an entry deadline? Was CBS so disgruntled with the contest that 60 Minutes started an investigation? But the foremost question has to be, why did Arnold enter? Whether or not the answers to these questions were ever known is anyone's guess. However, we have attempted to find the truth in a unique way by letting the people involved speak for themselves and then printing Arnold's side. And then it says, we apologize for the limited number of photographs and the quality, but the photographer who had agreed to send us photos suddenly canceled the arrangement under the threat of being banned from certain contests if the photos appeared in Muscle Digest. So you can see how Muscle Digest was kind of like a rebel magazine compared to uh, Weeder and uh, some of the bigger ones. But the photos they have in here are from Robert Nalon, who is from Australia and of course is a, a longtime photographer and, and friend of the sport. Okay, so the first interview is with Joe Gold, owner of World's Gym, Santa Monica, 46 years in the field, Olympia spectator who disqualified himself as a judge. MD, what did you think about the results, the contest and Arnold's winning? Joe Gold, I thought Arnold was the clear, clean cut winner. Uh, that night, he was the best up there. It was Arnold's night, that's all. The judging was absolutely honest. It was so close, Arnold didn't know until the last minute whether he was winning or losing. He wasn't in the best shape ever, but then everyone up there had some weak points, some lacking body parts. Prior to the contest, all the competitors were aware of the judges and no one complained. After the contest, everyone complained. Cole was ready, but lacked great abs. Chris lacks biceps. But Zane showed a lot of class, a real professional, but he looked flat. Dennis Tinarino should have placed much higher than he did. In Olympia judging, the lowest and highest scores are thrown out. It takes away the, those extremes, and Arnold ended up with the highest average. If anyone else says anything to the contrary, they're lying to themselves. Bill Pearl, bodybuilding legend, author of Keys to the Inner Universe, and the designated head judge of the Olympia. What was the judging criteria based on? Bill Pearl. Well, to begin with, I was the head judge, but I myself was not a judge. I felt that because of my close association with Chris Dickerson as trainer, advisor, etc., it wouldn't be fair to judge. So I declined a seat on the judging panel. Instead, I was the commentator for CBS. The judging panel was really controlled by Oscar State, even though I am the individual who gave the instructions down below as to how the contest theoretically was to be run. We had gone through a judging selection process months before in a way that would hopefully save the promoter and the IFPB unnecessary expenses. The only problem was, which we didn't realize at the time, that four of the judges we had on the panel had very strong emotional ties towards Arnold. Arnold only announced eight or maybe 10 hours prior to the contest that he was officially was going to enter the show. This was a giant mistake right there. He should have 30 days or so ahead of time. This was a flaw. This professional thing is relatively new. It still has flaws, but everyone's trying hard, believe me. I picked Dan Howard as a last-minute judge because I knew he couldn't be bought and that he is an honest man. I also picked Dr. Michael Walzik. Isn't there an IFBB law to prevent someone from entering late? No, there is nothing in the IFBB rules that states you can't. If it had been, Chuck Sykes, Larry Scott, or even myself that entered late, it would have been all right it would not have made that much difference. But Arnold's got a big name. He's got clout, a reputation. It made a hell of a difference. We're gonna have the rules changed to prevent this type of thing from happening again. The changes will be that competitors must accept 30 days prior to the contest 
unlike Arnold, who was given an invitation, but didn't accept until the final, until the last minute. Also, judges are going to have to be paid to go to the contest, wherever it is, so we don't have to pick judges from people who just happen to go to the contest. Also, certain rules on stage presentation, what a contestant can get away with and what he can't. We have, we have no rules against that now. We're going to have to second guess some of these guys and come up with some of these rules before the problems pop up. What did you personally think of the results? Arnold is one of the most fierce competitors I've ever seen in my life. I never realized what a fierce competitor was. I don't think Arnold won that contest on his physique alone. Eliminate Arnold's personality and everything from this conversation. I'm talking strictly physique. I do not think that Arnold was in the best shape of anybody on the stage and that he deserved to win. Now, that doesn't mean that he couldn't if he went out there and he trained five or six months and got into tip-top shape. Arnold could still walk away with these contests, even if his name was John Meade, he could do it. He has the ability to do so. In my opinion, the contest was between Dickerson and Co. if I'd been a judge. We understood from reports that Arnold did his own thing during the compulsory judging. How could he do this and get away with it? Well, there's nothing that says we can take off points. It never happened before. We're trying to correct these errors. We're doing all we can. The physique that Arnold had with somebody else's head, somebody, let's say, from Sweden, believe me, Arnold, that guy, would not have been in the top 10 of that contest. That's what bothers these guys. Possibly not the top 10. Again, I don't know. I didn't judge it. I'm just using that as an example. Maybe he could have been in the top five, top three, whatever. He would have, he would not have won the show. Put it to you that way. That's my opinion. Is there anything else you want to add? I was probably more let down and deflated than anything I had experienced in my bodybuilding career of 35 years. I felt bad for the contestants. I felt bad for Arnold. Wow. <laughs> Uh, Dan Howard, owner of Howard Sport Training Research Center, one of the last several or one of several last minute judge selections. MD, how were you selected? Dan, they didn't have as many qualified judges as they wanted. So Bill Pearl, who disqualified himself, asked me to be a judge. What did you originally go there for? I went there in case they needed help. There is only one way to help bodybuilding, and that is to get involved. So you make your services available. I had judged the California Grand Prix this year, so I felt I could contribute. How do you judge the Olympia yourself? Or how did you judge the Olympia yourself? I had Chris Dickerson to win, but the judges did not have to place anyone else. So I really can't say who placed where after that. Wait, let me read that again. I had Chris Dickerson to win, but the judges do not have to place anyone else. So I really can't say who placed after that. There were two or three that had the same number of points from me, but it's the combination of the seven judges' scores that places the competitors. According to the points then, as far as you were concerned, how would they have stacked up? Well, I think I would have placed Boyerko second, Frank Zane third, and Arnold or Menser fourth and fifth. Were you surprised that Arnold won? Yes. Do you have an explanation as to why you think he was selected? No. I guess some of the judges just figured they couldn't place Arnold as anything but a winner because of his past performances, but he wasn't in near as good a shape as I think he has been in the past. What percent of the past shape do you think he was? Maybe 75 or 80 percent. Do you think the film crew that was on, was on hand filming Pumping Iron 2 had any influence on the scheme of things, the way the contest was run, the way Arnold was performing on stage? Quite possibly, I don't know. I would have taken extra points off myself if I had been running the show. I would have warned him and then probably subtracted a point or points. Or a man could even disqualify somebody. You know, it's according to how far you want to take it. I mean, at last year's Olympia, anybody who didn't do exactly as they were told was reprimanded. And that didn't happen over there. Over here. It wasn't near as strict as compared to the past Olympias as far as Arnold was concerned. We understand that you're a personal friend of Arnold's. Do you know what his motivation may have been? No, I really don't. I worked out with him Friday morning before the show on Saturday, and I didn't know he was going to be in the show. I knew he was going to pose, guest pose. He even told me behind the gym, he even took me behind the gym and he asked me how he looked. I told him he looked great. But if he would have told me he was going to compete, I would have told him I didn't think he should. But we never did get that far in the conversation. 
That's interesting because you've watched the movie The Comeback. There's a, a scene of Arnold and Dan Howard training together. So that must be what he was talking about. Uh, MD, Arnold only trained three months after a five-year layoff while the others trained nearly all year, and they still lost. Many of the competitors felt this didn't seem right. Do you think this just reflects jealousy? I don't care if he didn't train at all. If he was good enough to win that day, that's all that matters. In my eyes, he wasn't up he wasn't up to what he used to be when he was winning it. So, you know, he shouldn't have won. That's the way I voted, and that's what I stand by, whether Arnold's upset with me or not. I hope as a personal friend that he's willing to go and train the whole year and come back at 100% of what he can be and win it outright and erase everybody's doubts. I still think he's probably the greatest bodybuilder in the world. Franco Colombo, doctor of chiropractic medicine, possibly the strongest professional bodybuilder, pound for pound in the world, and Olympia spectator. What is your opinion of Arnold's victory? He trained for three months, trained very, very hard, and he got into great shape and surprised everybody. He wanted the Mr. Olympia one more time, and he became Mr. Olympia for the seventh time. Do you know when he made the decision, the final decision to enter? As far as I know, he made the decision eight weeks before the contest. I think he said 90%. I'm going to compete, and 10% I, will, I am not. And then one week before, he said he thought he was going to compete, and I told him, in my opinion, he looked so good he should compete. What percent of his top shape, his former self, would you say he was in? Oh, I guess 80%. Do you honestly think that was good enough for him to beat out Dickerson, Zane, Coe, Menser, and the others? Do you think the win was justified? The win was justified. Arnold was just good enough to win. However, people expect him to be in his top shape, and that's why there were some complaints. But Arnold was better, and that's what counts. He was the biggest guy there. He was overwhelming when it comes to size. People have to remember when it comes to the Mr. Olympia, it takes three things to win. One, size. Two, definition. Three, symmetry. He had all those three. He, was, he just has it. Take, for example, Chris Dickerson. He was in top shape. He looked very good. But in my opinion, his arms are too small. So that's a big weak point when you see 17-inch biceps or so against Arnold's 21-inch biceps. Second, take Boyer Coe. He was in top, top shape. I was very surprised. He was in the best shape of his life. But Boyer Co. lacked certain things, chest, abdominals. But I thought he should have done better than he did. He should have placed higher than fourth, in my opinion, second or third. And Frank Zane has been better than that. This year, he looked very good. Great definition and posing. But he was not as thick as last year. A little on the thin side. Again, little points that makes one win against another. How about Mike Menser? To be honest with you, Mike Menser was in good shape, but when he poses, nothing comes out. He looks very awkward. He doesn't look even. Although he has very good thighs, calves, arms, and forearms, but something is not there that he will never get. In my opinion, he will never win Mr. Olympia. Was there anyone else you thought should have placed higher? To be honest with you, yes. Roy Callender and Dennis Tenorino. Chris Dickerson, second place at the 1980 Grand Prix champion, First black to ever win the coveted AAU Mr. America in 1970. What is your overall opinion of the 1980 Mr. Olympia results? My personal opinion is that it was sort of presented to Arnold and it should not have happened. Everybody knows that, including Arnold. He's a professional. I'm sure he knows. He wasn't in his top condition. It's like the rug was sort of picked out from under me and, I, and I'm denied the, denied the title. So I'm just a little flat. But I want to come back next year and win it. And the actual placing results? I think it was pretty much in line with the men that were there. But I think that there was two contests. There was a legitimate one with guys who trained hard for a number of months. And then there was another contest with us and Arnold superimposed on it. So in a sense, there were two competitions. Except for Arnold being first, it's great being second. And I think we sort of all fell in line after that. If it wasn't for Arnold, I would have been first. Is there anyone in your opinion that should have placed higher than they did? I hate to do that because I like all bodybuilders, 
Frank Zane is such a professional. He's the one I admire most. I looked at everybody there and I was relieved when I saw Arnold not in good shape. I thought, ha, it's between Frank and myself. I felt he was the man to beat, but I think he was maybe a little leaner than last year, but the man was in good shape. I must say, I think Tenorino should have been in the top six. I must say that. Were you shocked when Arnold won? Yes, I was, but I'm not bitter and I can't blame Arnold for competing. I don't blame anyone. You can't vote for yourself. So the judges voted. Arnold didn't vote. He just got in his blood to compete again. Later, Franco told me Arnold competed to prove he could do it again. If he had come in top shape, no one would have begrudged him the title. I think if Arnold was in top shape, nobody would feel badly, but they feel demoralized because a man with all that class can just step in at 60% of his top condition and still win. Frank Zane, third place, former three-time Mr. Olympia winner, one of the all-time bodybuilding greats. Nor note, a short time before the Olympia, Frank had a freak and serious accident when a poolside chair collapsed, dumping him awkwardly into the pool, puncturing his urethra in the process. The injury caused loss of sleep, severe agony, a total of two quarts lost blood, and hospitalization. But he still competed, even though he didn't feel right about it. What was your overall response to the Mr. Olympia 1980? Boyer Co., Chris Dickerson, and myself were in top shape or close to it, and I think that's where the real competition of the show should have been, those three people. Then how did you place Arnold, in your opinion? Well, if I were a judge, I'd put him in fourth, maybe even fifth, no higher than fourth. As far as your own placing and the shape you were in? Well, I thought I should have been higher. I was probably in the most muscular shape of my life. I may have been a few pounds lighter than last year, but I think I made up for it with extreme muscularity. Contrary to what people said your weight was this year, as opposed to last year's 190, what did you really weigh? About 186, 187, right in that area, a few pounds less. Anything else you want to say about the contest or placing? No, that's about it. Boyer Co., fourth place, perhaps the most competitive bodybuilder on the scene today, winner of every major title in the sport, a master poser. What is your overall opinion of the Mr. Olympia? I thought the way the thing came out made a mockery of the contest, which was always regarded as the Super Bowl of the highest standards in bodybuilding. Quite honestly, I feel Arnold was an undeserving winner. Why do you say that? What basis of fact do you use? The basis of fact I use are my eyes. I've been involved in bodybuilding 20 years now, and it's my opinion that if any of the second through sixth place competitors had won, I think they would have made a worthy winner, and certainly the audience and the contestants would have felt better. Arnold was not in anywhere near the condition he needed to win. I think he made the Olympia lose a lot of credibility. How about the judging? Judging is very subjective, but I felt there could have been a more detailed job of judging. I thought there must have been a total breakdown of the system. All the checks and balances that were supposed to be there failed. I felt the judging was to not totally responsible. How would you have placed the top five? I felt the competition was extremely keen between Chris Dickerson and right down the line to sixth place. I personally did not see Arnold in the top seven. Do you think this will hurt Arnold's credibility as a superstar? There is no question about it. Arnold may have won the contest, but he lost a whole lot more. He lost the total respect of not only the audience, the people who saw him in Sydney, and that's just one end of the earth, but more importantly, he lost the respect and admiration of his fellow bodybuilders. Other than the judging you mentioned, is there any other element you felt contributed to Arnold's victory? His antics on stage did an awful lot to disrupt the entire contest. Before the contest started, there was a meeting regarding how the contest was gonna be judged. Bill Pearl, head judge, stated very strongly that everyone would adhere to the rules completely or points would be deducted. Everyone did adhere to the rules completely with the exception of Arnold, and there were no points deducted, nor did anyone call him down for it. Arnold did exactly what he wanted. It was like a showcase for Arnold, and we were the puppies being manipulated. It was just like there were two sets of rules, one for Arnold and one for the rest of us. Mike Menser, fifth place, Mr. Universe and controversial superstar who placed second last year to Frank Zane. What is your opinion of the results of the Olympia? I don't feel the rightful winner was chosen, and because of the nature of the circumstances surrounding the competition, I don't feel the placing of the top six was in proper order. How would you have placed them? I feel the top three, at least, were myself, Boyer Co., and Chris Dickerson, possibly in that order. I don't feel Arnold was in the top six. And Frank Zane? 
I feel that Zane would have been in the top six along with Dennis Tenorino. It's very difficult for a competitor to be caught in the thick of things and see things objectively. But just from milling around backstage, it was obvious to me that Chris, Boyer, and myself were in the best shape of all the competitors. What did you think of the judges panel? It was a very poor judges panel. We were told that there weren't enough judges, so they had to choose from individuals present. Just one of the many ridiculous things that took place and cast a black eye upon the sport. What seemed to be the audience's reaction when Arnold was announced the winner? There was a mixed reaction. Surprise, of course, at first, but Arnold has a certain presence and he does have his followers. Likewise, he also, because of the condition he was in, had his detractors. I was somewhat embarrassed for him when at one point in the prejudging, it was quiet and people started calling for Arnold to go home because he was so flat. Could there be any jealousy among the other competitors because of the fact that Arnold trained just several months and literally came off the street to enter and win when others trained all year long? Of course, anyone could make that explanation. If, however, there was only two or three other individuals making these claims or statements that Arnold shouldn't have won, then the whole thing could be chalked up to sour grapes. But I haven't heard one competitor or one individual since the competition, and this includes people who saw the pictures and slides, after the competition, say that Arnold should have won. He obviously wasn't in his best shape, and the photos will bear this out. How about CBS's coverage of it? Who do you, how did who did they react? Well, it says, who did they react to the controversy? How did they react to the controversy? Arnold's tactics and those of his handlers were very disruptive. You had Franco Colombo coming on stage during the prejudging to give Arnold fresh oil and a towel. This is ridiculous. At one point, Arnold actually took Franco to the middle of the stage and introduced and made quips and anecdotes. Can you imagine during a boxing match, one of the boxers stopping the course of events to bring a friend in the ring and start making jokes just to get attention? They were also filming for the movie Pumping Iron 2 with George Butler. Arnold was obviously hamming it up, and the other competitors were just bit players, clowns, foils, in his act, and I didn't particularly like that. No other sport do you see this happen. All these lead up to Arnold winning. Perhaps it was the presence of George Butler and his filming crew making Arnold look like a big superstar and everybody else a bit player that caused the judges to see him in a different light. Are you sure they were filming Pumping Iron 2? Oh yeah, George Butler was there and he told everybody that's what he was there for. What percent of his former self do you think he was for the contest? I'd say 60%. Hmm. Wow, that was interesting. So I know George Butler was there and he was taking pictures. But uh, the only movie that came out of it was that comeback movie, which I believe Paul Graham uh, published. Okay, so now they got a re Arnold's rebuttal to the Mr. Olympia. So this is interesting. So it says, Arnold answers in rebuttal to the Olympia controversy. What was your opinion of your victory at the Olympia contest? Well, I was very happy when I won the competition. First, it was because, because it was winning it the seventh time, you know, breaking my own records. And on top of it, it meant beating a lot of new guys who came up in the last five years whom I've never competed against. So it was a great feeling beating all the new guys. But at the same time, I have to say that due to the time I had available for training and because of my late decision to enter, I did not come in the kind of shape that maybe I was in in 1975. At least this is what some of my close friends said and what I could say also, looking at the pictures and so on. But it was good enough to beat those guys and win the competition. It was very close, and I thought that the guys were in top shape and it made for a very rough competition, much more so than any other time that I have competed. What percent, what percent of the greatest shape were you in for this contest? I thought that I was near 90%. 90%? What parts were lacking? I think the overall definition was a little bit lacking. Also experience, basically. I mean, there were guys there who worked so much on their posing and were so in tune to their music and into the professional behavior on stage and so on. Whereas I have, not been, I have not been on stage for five years. This was really the first time that I was really in front of people again posing. It was a total surprise to me posing at the prejudging with music. And all of a sudden, I really had to pull my things together to win. And I worked very hard on it. Years ago, you said that you had retired. What prompted you, and at what point was it that you made a decision to compete in this thing? We understand it, was at, it wasn't at, until the last minute. Right. I started training when I came back from my vacation in Europe, which was at the end of July, beginning of August. We had a meeting for the rescheduling of Conan, the movie, 
and decided to start shooting in October in London and Spain. We looked at the shooting schedule and it was at the same time when Conan was supposed to be 40 and 60 years old, both times when he's already king. And at that time, he was very huge and well-fed because he had all the food he wanted as a king, and he's very muscular. So the question from the director was, could you get, by October, weighing around 230? Although I've been asking you all along to weigh 215. And I said, well, yeah, I can be 230, but I should be in as good a shape as possible. He said, I really don't need contest shape, but muscular and big looking, because in the film, your weight will change. By October, I want you to be 230 or 240. So I trained very hard, once a day in the beginning, and then twice a day, and then harder and harder. And then when it came very close to the competition, Weeder and Franco kept saying to me, why don't you compete in the Mr. Olympia contest? You're getting in all this terrific shape, and I think by the time you can be cut up enough, you'd make a great Mr. Olympia for a change. Who said that? Franco and who? And Weeder, Joe, Joe Weeder. Yeah, they kept saying, why don't you get in there? You will make a great Mr. Olympia for a change, this and that. That was three weeks before the contest. I kept saying, no, I really don't want to do it. I'm retired. I'd risk too much. One day I woke up and somehow had this gut feeling of jumping into the contest. You know, there was no rationale behind it, of course. Weren't you scheduled to go to the Olympia to guest pose? No, I was scheduled to be a judge over there. When did you make the final decision? The final decision was like two or three weeks before the contest. You told no one, right? Right. I told no one because I didn't know if I'd be able to pull it together. I wanted to go in with an open mind without calling Paul Graham and saying, put me down as one of the competitors because I didn't know for sure. I tried very hard. The last two weeks, I got a lot of injuries because of overworking the body and I had to get cortisone shots for the shoulders. It really screwed me up in a way for the competition because cortisone retains water in your system. I went over there with my ankle swollen and puffy, and Franco told me these were the side effects of cortisone, and I said I should just pose the whole day and sweat it out. I posed the whole day on Friday, and I got more and more defined. And then I called Ben Weeder, and I asked him to tell Bill Pearl that I would, in fact, be competing in the contest. When did you do that? Friday night, the day before the competition. There weren't any delay tactics on your part. Were they surprised? I really don't know about the reaction because I was staying in a different hotel. I was staying where Dennis Tenorino and some of the other guys were, downtown Sydney. The others were staying around the Sydney beaches. I had no communication with any of the other guys except Dennis Tenorino. That was it. I didn't see anybody until I walked into the Sydney Opera House on Saturday, noontime. I saw Frank and Christine Zane. They both smiled and shook hands and said something to the effect, welcome back to the club type of thing. Christine said, we wish the best of luck because you'll really need it today. And I said, yes, you're right. Then we had a meetings about weight classes and judges. Should there be one weight class or two? And should there be any judges excluded from the competition? That's the time they announced Bill Pearl pulled out as judge because of Chris Dickerson and Bill Drake pulled out because of me. But I really don't know the reaction of the guys there. I sensed, out, I sensed there was a certain coldness, but that's always the case on the day of the competition. We would like to put forth certain questions to you that we've heard from people. Their names are unimportant. On one side of the fence, we've heard that you were the best on that given night, although you weren't in your best shape, and that it was so close you didn't know you were going to win until the very last moment. Yeah, I'd have to say that was pretty accurate. It was a tough battle. I felt I really screwed up at the posing. I didn't know there was music until someone told me, and it really threw me off. I thought there were several guys whose posing was better than mine. Didn't anyone tell you about needing your own music? No. I said, well, do you have a tape here of Exodus? Because I posted that in 1975. Another athlete there had selected Exodus too, so I used that. Another rumor we heard was that when the compulsory posing came, you basically did your own thing and left, and you didn't give the compulsory poses as asked by the judges. Yet you were the only one, according to reports, who scored a perfect compulsory score. Well, first of all, this is not true. If you look at the judging sheets and talk to Judge Julian Bloomhart, he took several points from me because of my behavior on stage. He thought I did not do the poses the judges were asking for, so he gave me only 18 points or something like that. But we're not talking about a new Arnold behavior here. We're talking of an old behavior, a behavior I've always had. I always did one pose the judges asked for, and then I immediately doubled up with the second pose, which is something the judges didn't ask for. That's something I adopted against Sergio Oliva in 1970 
where the judges just called out poses and we just did three more after that. Like I said, it was just in a 1975 mentality when I had my pose off, especially when you hit a pose where you know you're not as good and then you try to double up and you make the judges forget the earlier pose. If they ask for an abdominal shot, I do that, but maybe only for three seconds and then immediately hit a most muscular pose. The judges have a choice of ignoring it, what I did as a second pose, or just take it. That's true. I did do that, but it was not new, strange behavior. The rules have changed since then a little bit. I was just waiting for someone to correct me. And they corrected me three times to move my feet, and that was it. Some people have said you made a mockery of the posing, that your showmanship actually overshadowed the actual physique posing, and that you were making fun of the show. I cannot say that. I have a personality on stage. I'm extremely happy when I get up on stage rather than being passive like most of the guys are. I sometimes bring humor to the whole thing. Yes, it's not new behavior. There was always so much humor in South Africa when posing with Franco. We laughed. We talked to each other. We did all kinds of things. We bumped into each other and we laughed our heads off. But it was serious competition and Franco really wanted to take the championship from me. The same with Sergio. A lot of fun. Now the guys are so serious, and I don't blame them for it. Maybe it's a new time, a new thing that I'm not aware of that they take very seriously. But I have my personality, and I will keep that, and I wouldn't change it for anybody. If I have fun on stage, and if I want to do things on stage, I do them, not because of disrespect for the sport. As you know, I put a lot of work into it to show that there is respect for the sport on my part. Some people have said that winning the Mr. Olympia again would not hurt your image as a film star and would promote you in the Conan role. Does this have any bearing at all? The Mr. Olympia contest is totally unrelated to Conan. It's not going to be a plus or minus for Conan. I wanted to have no publicity at all for a victory. I won it so many times, so this time was not overly exciting. It was like going through the motions, and it was like taking a risk. An example, we didn't feed it to uh, UPI or AP or any other cable service. I didn't want to have international publicity of coming back as a bodybuilding star whereas I've tried so much to become an actor. I did not enter for publicity, for Conan or anything. That was never a plan. If it would have been a publicity stunt, Universal could have held the biggest press conference in town, party and all. But because of my wishes, we just went on with our next business of going to Europe to film Conan. When Conan comes out in 81, believe me when you say to the media, the star of Conan is five times Mr. Universe and six times Mr. Olympia, it sounds just as good as if you say the star is five times Mr. Universe and seven times Mr. Olympia. It means no difference to them. Universal is putting 10 to $15 million in promotion in the film, and so we're getting enough promotion from that. I don't need the Mr. Olympia contest for promotion. You came in the contest weighing what? Between 225 and 230. Quite a few people suggested that the judges were friends of yours. Well, that's something nobody can say. When you're involved in bodybuilding for 18 years and when you've been a producer of world championship competitions for the last five years, and when you're directly involved in the politics of bodybuilding or putting together the professional section of bodybuilding, when you do all of that, you become very friendly with everybody and with every judge. I've been friendly with every judge. There are other bodybuilders who also deal with certain judges and are friendly with them. It's a small world. That's inevitable. But if they vote for you because of that, it's a totally different question. I'd say the best friends of mine did not vote for me. For example, Dan Howard, one of the judges and a skiing partner of mine, voted me third. And one of my all-time friends, Bloomhart from Belgium, voted me sixth or seventh. So here's two different guys that I've been extremely friendly with, more so than anyone else on the judging panel, and they did not vote for me. Some of the competitors have been saying that for the same thing for 10 years. Frank Zane, for instance, lost to Franco in 1976. He was very upset about the contest. The contest and judging were not that good, and he wasn't that impressed with the whole contest. Franco said the opposite. He said it was a great contest because he won. Now, the next year, Frank Zane won. It was the same judging panel, the same contest, more cash prizes. Otherwise, everything else was the same. And he came out and said, thank you so much, Arnold. It was the most wonderful experience in my life. The judging was so fair, so wonderful. Everything was just the greatest. I really want to thank you for life. The next year he came back and he said the same thing. And the next year too. At the same time, Robbie Robinson and Boyer Coe said it wasn't that good and complained heavily about the unfair judging. I think every contest is the same thing. The winner always says it was absolutely wonderful and everybody else will say it was not fair. This guy knew so-and-so or they never put me together with so-and-so. People will always use a way out. 
especially when you're dealing with a contest so close to the actual time, like this one, which is only three weeks old and people are very emotional. A year later, maybe people will have a different comment on it. I was always the kind of guy when I lost to say I was busted, I was fat, or I lost because the guy was just better. Like when Zane beat me in 68, he was better. He was more defined, it was obvious, and it proved that size does not always beat the smaller guy. When I was beaten by Sergio in 1969, it was obvious that he was better. I accepted it, and I was very happy about it. Some competitors have been saying that it just doesn't seem fair that they have been training all year long for this so hard, and here comes Arnold, who hasn't competed in five years, works out for two, three months, and wins the contest. How would you respond to that? Well, there is no such thing. You can't go into a contest and say, I have trained for so long, and Arnold has only trained for eight weeks, therefore it was not fair. It has nothing to do with it. If you go to a race car, you can put all the money in the world, everything you want into the car, and maybe Paul Newman gets a free car from the factory, and maybe he wins the race without any problem at all. That doesn't mean he isn't fair. It just means he has worked other ways that he can win with the least amount of effort. If you are an economist like I am, you have a common rule that with the least amount of effort, you get the most results. That's why I think Mike Menser's training principles are very appealing to many bodybuilders, because it's with the least amount of effort and the most amount of success. Let's say you would have lost. It would have probably been devastating to my ego to have lost, especially to Chris Dickerson, a small guy like that. It's one thing to lose against a Frank Zane, who has been established in the Mr. Olympia, or Franco or Sergio Oliva, but losing against Dickerson would have been more of a blow. Have you seen slides or pictures of the contest since you've come back? No, I haven't. I will pay more attention to them in the future because I am writing a book that will deal with all the details of weight training, and I'll need pictures for the book. So I'll go around to the photographers and get good pictures. People have said you weren't in your best shape, that you shouldn't have won. Do you have any reflections on that? I am unlike other bodybuilders. I have so many other things going for myself. I have so much to work. I have so much work that I pay very little attention to those things. The day after the Olympia contest, I left Sydney and I came home, packed my suitcase, and I went on to Columbus, Ohio to promote the universe contest. I really haven't talked to anybody about it. But if there would have been a sound meter there to measure the audience response, you would have noticed that I got the best response. I think if there are so many complaints this year, like you say, it's because it was such a shock to those guys. They put so much time and effort into it for the whole year. It was a shock to have someone who had been training for such a short period win the competition. Before, when guys competed, the only thing you lost was your pride and ego. Now it's become a money thing, professional. Now they're getting hurt financially as well as their pride and ego. Guys actually start making plans on how they're going to spend the twenty dollars or $30,000 check. They're counting on it. I think money has backfired. They are not used to that. There's too much seriousness going on. There's guys actually sitting at home waiting for the prize money, that income. And of course, if you don't win those events, you lose that money. Those guys should go back to work, use their minds a little bit more, and just get into other areas like I do or Franco. He put an enormous amount of effort getting that doctor title. While guys were laying on the beach, Franco was laying bricks and pouring cement to make money, working his way through chiropractic college. I got two degrees while doing the other things. We worked. Bodybuilders should not just wait for that check. They should do other things. If others believe you should have placed third, fourth, or fifth, how would you respond to that? I felt I was the winner. I'm very happy about winning the competition. <laughs> All right. What a great article, huh? Three weeks after the contest or right after the contest, John Mead got interviews with all these guys. So, you know, we talked about this contest 43 years later, but this was right after the competition. So that was a fantastic article. All right, let's move on to uh, another. Uh, this was the April 1981 issue of Muscle Digest. Now, this is written by Frank Burwash. Frank, I believe, was a judge or he was an official with uh, Australia. So... This was reprinted by the permission of the publishers of Muscle Australia magazine. It says, Bodybuilding Today saw the greatest lineup of champions in history. It also saw the greatest judging farce in modern times. The Mr. Olympia, which has come to be recognized as the Olympic Games of bodybuilding, has now sunk beyond recall. What started out as a mind-blowing experience ended in a tragic nightmare. Firstly, I was stunned by the stupidity of the result, like the rest of those who witnessed the spectacle, and I hoped that it was only a dream and not really happening. Alas, to our dismay, now that the initial shock has passed, 
we shudder at the realization that this travesty actually happened. Thankfully, the American CBS television network filmed the entire show, and we are told 700 million people around the world will witness the event. In this way, the entire world will be able to make up their own minds. And if they have any knowledge of bodybuilding at all, it will also conclude that this year's Olympia was a joke, a sad, sick joke, but nevertheless a joke. Arnold Schwarzenegger, the eventual winner, in quotes, thought the, the entire thing was a joke. He clowned around, never once obeyed an order by a judge's chairman. He posed after told not to, and he even tried to push other competitors off the stage. Indeed, if you watch the replay of the final pose down closely, you will see him purposely strike Australia's Roger Walker three times with an elbow jolt, trying to make him lose balance. We cannot blame Arnold for winning. He is a master showman, a great athlete, and always a fine competitor. He is also a good sport, and I'm sure he would have been the first to congratulate anyone else if they had defeated him. The ethical question is, seeing Arnold as a member of the Mr. Olympia Organizing Committee, and as he has actually promoted the contest in recent years, and as he will no doubt have a hand in promoting it in the future, how has he? How was he permitted to enter in the first case? Actually, promoter Paul Graham had announced on stage at the Mr. Australia in Brisbane on August 17th that his friend Arnold was coming out to help organize the show. And even shortly before the Mr. Olympia, Arnold was listed as a possible judge. No wonder the other contestants became upset, even before the contest. Bodybuilding's comedy of errors commenced when Bill Pearl, the much-publicized head judge, refused to judge and stated publicly that he did so because he had coached Chris Dickerson trained for the contest. Bill is bodybuilding's gentleman, and we must admire his absolute integrity. The problem is that by not judging, his integrity was sadly missed on the judging panel, and maybe the correct result would have been eventuated. It's impossible to get judges for the Mr. Olympia who are not in some way associated with at least one of the competitors, and together with all the spectators, I felt it was a shame that Bill's scruples prevailed. He should have been a great asset to the adjudication. At no time before the contest was I, as chairman of the judges for Australia, consulted. Okay, so that's who Frank was. He's the chairman of the judges in Australia. Or requested to supply names of any IFPB internationally qualified judges to be included in the ballot or judges selection. We were just as shocked as you to be told that the only judge to represent Australia at the Olympia panel was Brendan Ryan, who had, together with Paul Graham, been officially stood down as national judges because of their bad judging at the Mr. Australia contest two months earlier. The IFBB and Mr. Ben Weeder had been officially notified of the suspension at the time, and yet they selected this judge for the world's greatest contest with full knowledge that he had been stood down as a judge on the national level. Perhaps this is why the audience made bodybuilding history by loudly booing whenever this judge was mentioned. The contest itself was a fantastic affair. The standards were higher than ever before. After the mind-blowing posing exhibition by all 16 competitors, the final pose-down selection saw the elimination of the following. Tinerino, Emmett, Viator, Platts, Benut, Corny, Duval, Padilla, and Waller. The pose down continued with the top seven, namely Dickerson, Schwarzenegger, Zane, Coe, Menser, Walker, and Callender. Finally, after much comparison, the results were announced as follow. Sixth place, Roger Walker. Fifth place, Mike Menser. Fourth place, Boyer Coe. Third place, Frank Zane. Second place, Chris Dickerson. And first place, Arnold Schwarzenegger. When Menser was called out for fifth place, the raucous crowd sat totally quiet and unbelieving. During the lull, someone at the rear of the, sh the hall shouted, bullshit. And as Mike appeared on stage, he waved to his cheering fans and said loudly, yeah, bullshit, which brought cheers of approval. Frank Zane was also disgusted with his position of third place, and we have it on good authority that he wasted no time in smashing his trophy backstage. Chris Dickerson was given a wonderful ovation, and he was definitely the crowd's choice. Looking massive, well-defined, and faultless, he excited all with his superior physique. All hell broke loose when Arnold was declared the winner. Jeers and boos erupted throughout the opera house. Some irate fans walked out chanting, rigged, rigged. Others just sat in sheer amazement, saying to themselves, how can a guy with just a pair of arms win the Olympia? And of course, we all must agree that this is certainly not the criteria for winning any contest, much less the Olympic Games of bodybuilding. We Australians are justifiably proud to have had the good fortune 
fortune to witness the Mr. Olympia on our shores, we are also very upset at this tragic, farcical result. We want the world to know that we had absolutely nothing to do with the result, as we had no say in either the selection of the judges or the conduct of the Mr. Olympia contest. Finally, we strongly suggest that a full inquiry be made of the show, its organizers, and the judging, and the results be made public. For unless there is unquestionable integrity at the zenith of our sport, then bodybuilding as a competitive sport is doomed. Wow. So that was Frank Burwash from Australia. All right. So let's move to the 1981 Olympia. All right. This was from the March 1982 issue of Muscle Mag International. It was written by Bob Kennedy, the publisher of the magazine. It says, the following article is one of dismay and frustration. The 1981 Olympia result was not in line with audience feedback, the most knowledgeable bodybuilding audience in the world. Muscle Mag International is not blaming the IFBB, Ben, or Joe Weider. Heaven knows they do their best to upgrade world bodybuilding. There is nothing for them to gain by masterminding Franco's win, nor do we blame Arnold, Oscar State, or Roger Schwab, all of work, whom work very hard to promote the sport of bodybuilding. Franco himself is only the centerpiece in a circumstantially complex situation. A great champion, yes, still great, but alas, not, in our opinion, deserving of the very top spot on this occasion. There is, however, an inconsistency, as in recent contests. To the great majority of the audience, the wrong man took home the bacon. In no picture does Franco show that he had an appreciable leg impressiveness. His thighs appeared totally void of cuts and muscle quality. It is possible that perhaps his win will be upheld as a truly valid one in other publications. Whatever they claim, you can be sure you will never see a picture of Franco at this contest with legs that compare even remotely to the next 10 men he beat out for the Olympia title of 1981. The rules of the contest were reiterated very clearly by Oscar State at the commencement of the show. By their definition, it cannot be concluded in any way other than the wrong man was awarded the title in Columbus. It says, while Boyer Co., Frank Zane, and Mike Menser were staying loose in Southern California, Danny Padilla, Chris Dickerson, Tom Platts, and Roy Callender were uptight and getting well and truly shafted out of a higher placing in Columbus, Ohio. All at the expense of the one and only Arnold Schwarzenegger, who footed the bill, an apparently inept judging panel, who brought down the verdict, and Arnold's Sardinian sidekick, Franco Colombo, innocent of any wrongdoing, yet the key character in a disappointing turn of events who could, if he was sincere, make amends by returning the trophy from whence it came. Like the Australia Olympia last year, this time Columbus followed up with an equally sour tasting outrage. Some say that the Australian affair was even superseded for its reported in unacceptable inequities of justice. In the opinion of this writer and the vast majority of the audience at the Veterans Memorial Auditorium on October 10th last, 39-year-old Franco Colombo should not, based on the IFBB scoring system or any other scoring system with judges the entire physique, repeat, have not won the 1981 Mr. Olympia title. Instead of jumping eight feet in the air on being awarded the Olympia trophy, Franco should, if audience reaction counts for anything, have marched over to Tom Platts and placed the Sandow statute together with the $20,000 first place check in his hands. When the crowd favorite, Tom Plass, was announced by MC Len Boslin as being third, the crowd almost rioted. The boos were tumultuous, and they went on for almost three minutes. Rick Wayne, sitting next to Joe Weider, jumped uncontrollably to his feet, his choice of words not of their usual eloquence. Shit, 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 it's all a bunch of shit. Seeing a possible riot on his hands, and I, and I might say, as awed and surprised as the rest of us, Joe literally jumped to his feet and ran out of the auditorium. As the results narrowed to Dickerson being second, leaving Colombo in first place, Joe declined to come up on stage and hold up the hand of the victorious Franco. I upset my brother Ben enormously, said Joe, and I am a great fan of Franco's, but I didn't feel he should have taken first place today. Not given to drinking or swearing, Joe downed two full glasses of wine in the Sheridan bar and angrily declared, what is it with those fucking judges? Why can't they be honest? I want our shows to be honest. It was perhaps significant that Arnold Schwarzenegger also declined to raise Franco's hand in victory on stage, but for a different reason. 
The action would have invited the longest and loudest collection of boos in the history of bodybuilding. Wisely, the victory photos were done backstage after the show had ended. So, was the contest fixed? Did Arnold arrange it so that his Sardinian friend could win, thus showing Cole, Menser, etc., that both Franco and Arnold could come back anytime they wanted and win? That is the question to be answered, as is there a commercial interest here? Rumor has it that Franco is on the cover of Simon & Schuster's new book, Pumping Iron 2, and doubtless that book would sell far better with the current Mr. Olympia on the cover. But does Arnold benefit from the sales? Has he got part of the action? Others say that Tom Platz is on the cover, so that kiboshes that little theory. Let's clear the air first about the IFBB involvement. Both Joe and Ben Weider wanted the best on the day man to win. Their reasons differ slightly. As president of the IFBB, Ben Weider wants to run a smooth operation. He needs to be beyond criticism. The IFBB is now a worldwide organization and inevitably a ready target for criticism. It ties in with the commercial interest, but also hopes to better bodybuilding and certainly raises it, if not to Olympic status, to worldwide acceptance as a legitimate sport. And who knows, it could just be part of the Los Angeles Olympic scene in 1984 as a demonstration sport. The last thing Ben Weider needs is the cry of fix hanging over the IFBB banner. Ben has nothing to gain by Franco winning. He did not fix this contest. Joe, too, does not have an obvious advantage to Franco winning. True, the two are good friends, but the Weider organization would probably benefit from a new blood winner because, let's face it, the Olympia has been won now by just three men over the last 11 years. It craves a different face to be a professional champion of the year. Joe Weider wanted the best man to win because he is still a bodybuilder at heart. And in spite of his alleged lust for money and his need to dominate the sport with his Weideristic philosophies, he is very much for the bodybuilder. Many of the champions frequently disagree with Joe, fight with him, but when it comes down to the bottom line, they can talk bodybuilding with him until kingdom come. There is always mutual understanding. Joe has none of the Olympia entrants under contract and so would gain nothing from any particular win. In fact, the only man currently under contract being paid a weekly salary is Britain's Bertel Fox, and the organizers kept him out of this Columbus show. So much for Weider influence. No, Joe Weider did not fix this year's Olympia. So who, if anyone, did fix this damn contest? Was it Arnold? The infamous Arnold? The Austrian oak so loved and cherished by us all? For so many years, Arnold could do no wrong, and then his reputation became slightly tarnished. In spite of popularizing bodybuilding to make progress from the back pages of comic books to the front covers of the world's leading magazines, and trying to put the sport on the map, Arnold was gradually becoming less loved behind the scenes. Gone was the shy, wide-eyed kid with 22-inch arms. Hail to Arnold the businessman. Cunning, unpredictable, challenging, hungry for financial success universal fame and the spoils that go with it. But still, his fans adored him. They had no hint of his boundless drive for material success, even if he ostracized pals and colleagues in the process. One by one, former friends and training partners dropped by the wayside, victims of Arnold's relentless drive for success. But the fans stayed loyal. Never in his life had Arnold known the sound of a booing audience until Australia. And even in that country, the booze only trickled through when the fated decision was made, giving him the most controversial Olympia title ever. But then things changed. Suddenly, the fans found themselves quick victims of Arnold's disdain. Quickly following the Australian affair came Arnold's Pro Mr. Universe for 1980, charted to be the best ever show, with the promised treat of the current Mr. Olympia as a guest poser. As fate would have it, the reigning Mr. O was Arnold himself, but he didn't bother to remain in shape even those few weeks between shows, and accordingly refused to pose for his loyal fans. That broken promise fielded both contempt and boos that rocked Arnold's throne, the first boos ever directed point blank at the Austrian Oak, snatching away some of the long-held esteem among his fans. But was his lesson learned? Did Arnold arrange this contest? Was Franco given this title? Surely it was given as opposed to earned, to pay back those other competitors for signing the letter? Rick Wayne, the master reporter and untiring seeker of truth, confided that in his opinion, Arnold did not influence the judging in any way. I had dinner with Arnold the other night and he told me Franco shouldn't enter. Bob, I honestly feel that Arnold had nothing to do with all of this. I'm gonna title my article in Muscle and Fitness, Shafted. 
But I know, believe me, I know Arnold had nothing to do with it. Maybe so. But Arnold's buddy and former business partner in the association, Bill Drake, could certainly have influenced the environment. One tape machine records that his vociferous phrase, praise and loud ravings about Franco's great condition was very much in evidence in the judge's circle. Not the sort of thing you expect from a standby judge. The event shows that if the fix was in, then it had to be among the judges. Much as his, detra as his detractors may like to pull this man from his throne, we cannot point the finger at Arnold. He did not, repeat, not select the judges. That was done entirely by the IFBB. This leaves Arnold unquestionably in the clear. Maybe a significant number of judges simply thought that Arnold would want Franco to win or place well, and accordingly, to please their mentor, arranged their score sheets sympathetically, not realizing that all-round favor would actually give Franco the title. Were they afraid to destroy a legend, asked IFBB head Ben Weeder. Whatever the case, Colombo, well-liked as he's always been, did not appear to deserve the win, the 1981 Mr. Olympia. Reason? Not totally dissimilar to Arnold in Sydney, Australia the previous year. In bodybuilding terminology, he had no legs. Whether due to his knee injury several years ago in the World's Strongest Man contest or because of his extended layoff from bodybuilding contest, Franco did not possess well-trained, defined, and cut-up thighs. Let's, for the time being, forget that he has bow legs, a phenomenon that Judges Chairman Oscar State earlier said would cause points to be deducted. Let's forget that his calves are under par, that he had at this show the beginning of that unslightly conditioned bitch tits, shared also by Australia's Roger Walker, and championed by Germany's Hubert Metz. Let's forget the short golf ball biceps, square waist and blocky appearance. The man had no legs. Jim Lorimer, co-promoter of the show, told me after the contest, everybody's crying fix. But the judging sheets show that the majority of judges voted first place to someone other than Franco. His win is the result of a general high placing. Until the awards presentation, the 1981 Olympia was great. Arnold gave a powerful speech in which he acknowledged the irate crowd. I hear de boos. And he went on to praise his audience, with the result that the boos miraculously changed to rampant cheers. He told us not to think only of how to make money from the sport, but to help it along by trying twice as hard to promote it positively. We were then treated to his own typical brand of propaganda, a trailer for Conan the Barbarian due to be released in March, and a preview of his clever and humorous new Diet 7-Up commercial. Ironically, although Diet 7-Up was the official sponsor for the show, I couldn't buy a glass of it anywhere. In spite of the show's outcome, the weekend brought a few laughs, I had traveled down with my wife, Linda, photographer extraordinaire Chris Lund, and his wife, Mary. Incidentally, Chris was so outraged at the Olympia goings-on that he has refused outright to write about the event. The source of our mirth? None other than Johnny Fuller from Britain. Tell me something different, said Chris Lund, holding his tape under Johnny's nose at the eve of the contest. Well, says Johnny in all sincerity, I am going to mummify myself tonight. I need to lose some water, and I'm wrapping myself in garbage bags and sheets overnight. Johnny then said, Johnny then lit up a cigarette for cuts, he said. The next morning, Fuller came down to breakfast, replete with garbage bags under his tracksuit. I've had a terrible night, he sighed, but I've lost nearly two inches around my waist. With that, he ordered breakfast, a plate of raw onions to clear his head. Johnny Fuller is the most different bodybuilder I've ever met. His training practice, as you may know, is to work each exercise 10 sets of 32 reps. At the Olympia, Johnny was first on, posing his awesome vein-choked physique to the delicate strains of once, twice, three times a lady, proving once again that he is indeed unique. Talking about music, each competitor chose his own brand to pose to, and some were catastrophically bad. Somehow, pure classical music no longer works with the modern bodybuilder's routine. Franco's operatic choice was so heavy that one simply dared not applaud, not a murmur until the routine closed. Alternatively, Canada's Roy Callender, who was in unbelievable shape, a minute waist and ripped to shreds, had his tape break within a few seconds of playing. The theater staff tried to fix it, but failed, so Roy told the audience, it doesn't matter, I'll pose the silence. What followed made history. Roy ultimately, because of his superb, superb condition, Opposed to the greatest music of all, 
the nonstop screams of joy and appreciation from 3,000 devoted fans, which all but lifted the roof off the auditorium. My own thoughts about music choice lean towards hard rock as being the most appropriate. Co, who was not present at the show, has a very good tape of heavy rock, and Frank Zane's Pink Floyd choice is superb. At this show, however, the first prize for musical interpretation has to go to Samir Banu. His choice starts with some chirping birds, which has the audience looking up to the rafters for the little feathered creatures, while Samir raises his arm outwards and slowly twists from side to side. At this initial stage, one could be given for, forgiven for stifling a yawn. And then it happens. All hell is let loose with a series of heavy musical chimes. And as each thunders out, we find Samir in a different dynamic pose. The most sensational presentation of all the competitors. Physically, Samir continues to improve. One day, the O will be his. If Benut's routine was the most dramatic and memorable, then Chris Dickerson's was the most professional and innovative. He must have had it professionally choreographed. It does not supersede his previous Grand Prix routine, but it is nevertheless superb with its turns, karate moves, and general tableau. Chris has since registered his disappointment. I've been done out of this title two times now. I feel like retiring. Tom Platts gave us music, posing, and muscles. Boy, did he give us muscles. He's so big, he could easily be a turnoff for the ladies. But just the opposite, every gal in the audience loved him. Tom has Z charisma and was definitely the people's choice for the crown. Back at the Sheridan Hotel immediately after the show, Ricky Wayne stuck his tape under the famous jowls and solicited Platts' opinion of the proceedings. I am here tonight because of Franco and Arnold, and I have the greatest respect for both of them. I do feel I should have placed higher, however. A more mild-mannered, gentlemanly reply would be hard to find. Amid a throng of supporters loudly claiming him as Mr. Olympia 1981 in the hotel lobby, Platts was being typically diplomatic and downright good-hearted. Bitch tits is the only thing that comes to mind when Germany's Hubert Metz steps on the podium. It's a condition caused by the female hormone estrogen bringing about slightly feminization of the nipple area. Metz is a fine man, quiet, unassuming. His physique is ripped all to hell, but the indication would be that he is dipping too heavily into the roids. The surprise of the show was the appearance of Rochester's Danny Padilla, not that he is an irregular Olympian, but never has he achieved this kind of condition before. Surely the most perfectly set up physique in the contest. No one else has the wide shoulders, narrow hip look of this giant killer. In addition, his lowers are magnificently full and his joints neat and trim. To top it off, he has upper arms that overshadow even the big boys. My only criticism, he needed more color and possibly a little more thickness in his chest. Oh yes, and one more thing, Danny, you need to get mad. Pose with a do or die determination. And who was the judge who gave Danny only 15 points for the relax round? Outrageous. What can you say about Josip Wilkosh? He was three pounds heavier than at his Pro Universe win the year before. He is tall, has the body, the cuts, the tan, yet he doesn't quite make it to the top. Possibly his posing presentation is a little mundane. Steve Davis was in shape, but alas, in this Olympia company, because of the height bone relationship, he invariably appears too lean. Replete with abdominals, cross-striated triceps, and superb upper thigh muscularity, Steve still cannot break into the Olympia winner circle. Incidentally, that posing routine, Steve, it has got to go. Making a welcome return to the Olympia was none other than Mike Katz, whom I did, who I understand is now a natural bodybuilder. Dare I say it, possibly the only one in the show. Mike was sharper than at previous shows, tanned up, ready to go, but lacking an important massiveness. Curiously, his hair and posing trunks were exactly the same color. Incredibly, born-again Christian Dennis Tinarino has gone disco. Seldom does one see a routine change this dramatically. Dennis hasn't been, has been competing for 20 years, and today he looked more like Bill Grant doing his man in his fog routine. Without the fog, Dennis appeared a shade smaller, but definitely in shape. Ed Corny, under-tanned, under-duress, and by the look of his gray hair, under-strained. One gets the impression that Corny could still come back a winner because he's done it over and over again. When he sets his mind to being right up there, it happens. Today, not even his posing was inspirational. Carlos Rodriguez, the Iron Cowboy, looked pretty hard, but is unable to turn the tables on his fellow competitors. Ken Waller still has the most of his still has most of his physique, 
but he needs to work on showmanship and sparkle to really impress. Due to an injury, his arms appeared down and his color was in dire need of attention. While he posed at the night show, some smarty pants near me wondered aloud if Waller had swiped Mike Katz's t-shirt again. A highlight of this show was Russ Testo of Troy, New York, who did, for want of a better name, a mind posing routine, which was absolutely fabulous. Russ didn't have an Olympian body, neither did he need one, for this super presentation. You'll be hearing a lot more of this guy, that's for sure. So Franco Colombo is officially the 1981 Mr. Olympia. Arnold, who meanwhile intermittently continues his love-hate relationship with friends, business acquaintances, an entire TV network, and a significant percentage of fans, is no longer promoting the show. So roll on to the Wembley Auditorium in London, England, 1982, where perhaps once again, the Olympians can hope for a fair deal. As I packed up my cameras at the conclusion of the show, a film cameraman new to the sport asked me, so what happens now? Will the, case, will the decision be appealed or is this it? I tossed my battered Veronica into my case and slammed the lid. No such luck. I said, this is it. <laughs> All right. The great Bob Kennedy, Robert Kennedy. That was his review of the 1981 Olympia. And I've got one other article here to read. And this comes from Muscle Digest. This was February 1982. And this is their 1981 Mr. Olympia re, uh, re, report. It says, Mr. Olympia, Franco's Hollow Victory, stories by Kevin Campbell and Joe Tripoli. And they've got a ton of great pictures in this magazine, man. They really went all out. Awesome, clear photos. And they've got the whole judges' uh, score sheets in here, too. Every round breakdown, so it's great. Uh, the Spectator's View by Kevin Campbell. It is only fitting to begin an article about the 1981 Mr. Olympia competition by remembering what happened at last year's contest. To no one's surprise, the event this year picked up with an air of controversy it left off with last year. Recall that on the eve of the 1980 event, Arnold Schwarzenegger unexpectedly announced that he would be in the event, not just as an organizer, but as a competitor. With a camera crew ready to film a sequel to Pumping Iron, Arnold was picked by the winner by a group of judges, which included some substitute judges chosen at the last minute to fill in for previously scheduled judges who disqualified themselves. Perhaps in no previous Olympia had the judges been so second guessed and criticized as they were after the 1980, 1980 Olympia. Full of hard feelings, some bodybuilders who competed at last year's event immediately began talking about boycotting this year's Olympia. Significantly, three of the most respected figures in bodybuilding, Frank Zane, Mike Menser, and Boyer Co., did not compete in the 1981 contest. The controversy surrounding the 1981 Mr. Olympia is sure to surpass that of last year's competition. The 1981 IFBB Mr. Olympia competition returned to Veterans Memorial Auditorium in Columbus, Ohio, on October 10th. On the same bill was the Mr. International competition. Once again, Arnold Schwarzenegger was present, this time as an organizer of the event. When Arnold stepped onto the stage before the start of the Olympia, he was greeted by a mixed crowd reaction of applause and boos. He responded by saying, I hear the boos. While Arnold was addressing the audience, he was drowned out several times by angry fans, yelling, where's Menser or where's Zane? But after this lukewarm reception, Arnold was able to win over the audience with his magnetic personality. When Arnold left the stage, the event that so many bodybuilding fans had traveled from around the world to see started. Each of the competitors was individually announced and stood proudly under the spotlight against a completely dark background. Many familiar faces were there. Steve Davis went through a very tasteful posing routine, emphasizing movement and grace. Unfortunately, he looked small on stage and this prevented him from becoming one of the finalists. Dennis Tenorino, one of the biggest bodybuilders, was warmly received by the audience. Although he sported the confident smile and masterful stage presence, he was not at his peak for this contest. Ed Corney demonstrated why he is called the master poser, but unfortunately no longer has the abs or size he once did and was unable to make the final cut. Two other veterans of the sport, Ken Waller and Mike Katz, were also there, although they did not display the physiques of former years. Samir Banut got a big reception from the international crowd and delivered a masterful posing exhibition, However, he lacked the definition necessary to place in the top six. Hubert Metz, a newcomer to the Olympia, showed impressive vascularity, 
but did not place high in this year's event, although he may well be a threat in future Olympias. Other notables who threw down the gauntlet were Johnny Fuller and Carlos Rodriguez. Without question, though, the athletes displaying the most impressive physiques were the six finalists listed in the order in which they were announced finalists. Padilla, Wilkosh, Callender, Platts, Colombo, and Dickerson. Although these were the six best bodybuilders of all those who entered the contest, the final placing of them sparked controversy. Indeed, many in the audience believed that the end result was not made on merit and could just as easily have been made by drawing straws. Danny Padilla, always a crowd favorite, came in his best ever shape. Padilla was easily the shortest man on stage, but he was a giant with his followers. Padilla looked very good overall, displaying a nice balance of mass, proportion, and definition. Unfortunately, his performance was marred by a poor stage presence. Danny could not rid himself of a sarcastic look on his face and defeatist attitude. It was clear that Danny did not believe he could win the Olympia because of his height or size or proportion. Padilla's attitude detracted from his appearance, and he would do well in the future to change this. Nevertheless, Padilla looked good and is a worthy challenger for the title. <clears throat> Joseph Wilkosh made his debut at the Olympia with his own brand of style as the tallest and the only bearded finalist in the group. As last year's Mr. International winner, he faced fierce competition in this year's Olympia. Wilkosh was in prime condition and he looked hungry for a win. However, Wilkosh's posing routine was sluggish, and his face was, for the most part, expressionless. He did not show off his body to his best advantage, and with a little more experience and work, he may one day win the Olympia. Roy Callender looked beastly and was clearly the most muscular competitor in the field. Just as the massive Canadian started this routine, the music he was posing to, all of the contestants posed to music, stopped. Callender was disgusted and left the stage temporarily. The audience booed, expressing sympathy with Callender's predicament. As he came out for the second time, Callender was greeted with great applause, and even though his music stopped again, Roy continued to pose, and the crowd reacted with even more enthusiasm. As it turned out, Callender completed his posing routine just as well without the music. Callender rose to the occasion, displaying superb thighs and clearly the best chest of all the competitors. His chest was massive, rounded, and cut, and reminiscent of Arnold's in his heyday. Callender's back and arms were so big and rippling with definition. The only weak point Roy displayed was his calves, which due to heredity are high on his legs and not quite big enough. Tom Platt stepped on stage as the clear audience favorite to the rhythmic chant of Platts, Platts, Platts. Tom responded by electrifying the crowd with a devastating leg shot. Platts is easily the most improved bodybuilder around and displayed a ripped upper body with tree trunk legs chiseled to perfection. Platts had a marvelous stage presence, always showing a grin from ear to ear. He seemed to look confident and enjoy himself. His only deficiency is that his legs are so big and they are out of proportion with his upper body. Franco Colombo initially received a warm greeting from the crowd. After all, he has not competed since his unfortunate knee injury five years ago. His appearing in the competition caught the audience by surprise, much like Arnold's appearance did last year. Franco's upper body was proportionate and ripped. He had the most upper body vascularity of the finalists, and he managed to regain his famous lat spread. None of the other contestants could match Franco's lat spread. Also, Franco sported the unusual split across his chest as in former days. Unfortunately, Franco's legs were without question the worst on stage of all the contestants. His thighs and calves had some size, but they were not cut at all. This severely detracted from his overall appearance. Chris Dickerson was the last athlete to pose and sometimes the best to save for last. Chris looked fantastic overall with a good balance of size, definition, and proportion. He displayed that same superb physique that placed him first in the Grand Prix circuit last year. Chris posed in a fluid and artistic fashion. His calves and thighs were big and cut. His abs looked good. His chest and back were in peak condition. Perhaps the only deficiency with Dickerson was his biceps, which were slightly small in proportion to the rest of his body. Nevertheless, Crystal looked devastating overall. After all the competitors had finished their individual posing routines, the six finalists were called onto the stage to perform the compulsory poses. For the first time in the evening, the crowd could see the finalists posing at the same time. At one point in the mandatories, Padilla stepped out of place and stood next to Franco before the judges could tell Danny to return to his spot. When the compulsories were completed, the contestants put on a free-form posing exhibition 
that nearly brought the crowd to its feet. Platts and Dickerson flanked Franco and highlighted leg shots, while Franco concentrated on upper body poses. But the high point of the show was after the contestants were told to step back off the platform and relax while the judges tabulated the results. Playfully, Platts and Dickerson, still flanking Colombo, continued to match legs with Franco. Colombo responded by twisting and turning his upper body. Meanwhile, the other athletes got involved in the action, and eventually all six went back on stage to continue the fierce rivalry. The audience went wild with applause and excitement. Then came the moment of truth. The judges announced their decision. Wilcox finished sixth, Padilla fifth, Callender fourth, Platts third, Dickerson second, and Colombo first. The crowd erupted three to one with boos when Franco was declared the winner, leaving no doubt in anyone's mind that the vast majority of bodybuilding fans in the audience disagreed with the result. It is true that the groups of fans expressed disappointment with each stage of the judging. Some people booed when Wilcox was awarded sixth place and Padilla awarded fifth place. But this should not be interpreted to mean that bodybuilding fans are poor sports or unknowledgeable so that the judges can announce just any decision at all because they cannot please everyone all of the time. Although there is a subjective element involved in, in judging every bodybuilding contest, a viewer can still look to several objective criteria such as size, proportion, symmetry, definition, vascularity, etc. to aid in his decision. The audience is capable of considering these objective factors and knows when they are disregarded. The crowd knew it that night in Columbus when Calendar was awarded fourth place because the boos increased dramatically. However, it was no disgrace for Calendar to place behind Platts and Dickerson considering the fine shape they were in. The booing increased again when Platts was declared the third place finisher, but the crowd's reaction came to a head when Dickerson was named the runner-up and Franco announced the winner. The fans rose to their feet and reacted with deepening shouts and boos while Callender and Dickerson left the stage. Relatively few waited around long enough to see Franco receive his first place trophy. Colombo may have been the biggest name in the controversial 1981 Mr. Olympia, a contest that unattended by many of the premier bodybuilders, but in the face of the crowd's reaction, it must have been a hollow victory for Franco. All right, and then they have one other article here. This is by Joe Tricoli, and this one is the judge's view. So that article I just read was the spectator's view, now, Joe is obviously a judge, and he writes an article about the 1981 Mr. Olympia result. He said, along with the crackling sound of Franco's protruding patella in the world's strongest man competition, so went many beliefs that the reigning king of bodybuilding would keep his title. The hearts of his followers were destroyed by the notion that this super Sardinian would no longer strut his stuff under the lights. Regardless of the individual's opinion on the outcome of Franco's 1976 Mr. Olympia victory, the vast majority felt his remaining years would be spent in the chiropractic office. Then how, one might ask, could it be that the man who wasn't supposed to walk again deny their idols of the 1981 Mr. Olympia title? That, my friend, has proven to be the root of this entire so-called controversial contest. Columbus, Ohio was the dateline of this year's most sought-after bodybuilding award. In this town, the best physiques in the world came to compare what their hard work has produced. There were the ever-present Chris Dickerson followers to cheer for their hero, and Roy Callender's following from our neighbor to the north was second to none, along with the other fan clubs pulling for their individual immortals. From these rival groups came an unmistakable feeling that under no circumstances would all those in attendance be fully satisfied by the decision of this international judging panel. The point that the panel was international should be stressed. Inviting judges from many different countries ensured that widespread opinions and attitudes were present. Thus, a difference of criteria would be undeniably used to choose a winner. By choosing an international panel, the IFBB had eliminated any possibility that the promoters or any of the competitors involved could have had strong ties to a majority of judges. Sure, one could advance the argument that judges from given areas of the world might be biased towards competitors from the same regions, but by no means could one competitor have any advantage or disadvantage cumulatively. Beyond the previously mentioned precaution, the high scores and low scores for each competitor were thrown out to further ensure a valid decision. The accusation that Franco was favored by the judges is quickly put to rest when one views the scoring with an open mind. As a matter of fact, Franco only earned a few first place votes from the judges. The majority of his marks were for second place. That seemed to be an almost unbending decision among the judging panel. 
Sure, Chris Dickerson, Tom Platts, Roy Callender, and Danny Padilla all had their high marks. But remember, the high and low scores for each competitor were thrown out. It is the competitor's comparative total scores that count. This point will be discussed in more detail later in the article. In a packed auditorium with so much emotion rampant, one could just imagine the noise and varied opinions being strongly expressed. As each competitor took his individual turn on stage, it seemed as though various sections of the crowd gave their favorable remarks and yells of reassurance. When Danny Padilla marched proudly to center stage, he showed the most perfected physique to date. Unfortunately, his amateurish posing could not compare with the product he was displaying. So needless to say, when the giant killer was announced as fifth place, his cheering section adequately displayed their displeasure with the judge's placings. Roy Callender, the largest man in the entire contest, strode to the podium with a professional attitude, untouched by his previous showings. The Canadian's corner came totally prepared to accept the overall title and nothing else. Yes, on the whole, his physique was greatly improved, but one must be fair and state that his calves were hardly the best on stage. The announcement that Callender had to settle for fourth place was barely heard through the still raucous Danny Padilla fans. As the Calendar crowd and the Padilla backers joined together in contrary moans, the walls seemed to be shaking. What could be said about Platts, whose upper body has improved to the point that it is almost equal to his lower body? The key word is almost. His unmatchable thighs are still the focal point of his physique. Unfortunately for Tom, it is going to take even more Herculean gains on his upper body to match the best legs bodybuilding has ever seen. As with other fans, the Platts backers were not prepared for a loss. Their unhappiness with the third place decision was portrayed by a deafening growl. Unmistakably, the crowd favorite, Chris Dickerson, looked superb. As always, his almost hypnotizing grace nearly convinced those in attendance that his body was flawless. But upon closer inspection, the much improved biceps still do not appear to belong on the same body as the famous Dickerson diamonds. He who was present could not in his wildest dreams imagine the chaos that followed. No man, regardless of how deserving he was, could have possibly been awarded first place and received the blessings of all in attendance. Sure, each man would have had his share of cheers, but one cheering section could never have drowned out the boos from the other unhappy sections combined. Understandably, it could, it could have been interpreted as controversial, but the more appropriate word would be emotional. Emotions has spelled the word fix more times than the notions to fix a contest were ever thought of. There has never been a subjective type sport, such as ice skating or diving, in which some of the decisions were not questioned. Franco's fans greeted him with an extreme warm welcome. It seemed as though old friends had been reunited after, seeing, after being forcibly separated for decades. His overall presence was mesmerizing, to say the least. It seemed as though a time machine had turned back our minds to the not-so-distant past when Franco and the Austrian Oak battled while in friendship. Franco's tan proved that he left nothing to chance in his contest preparations. He, just as every other one of the favorites, was very deserving of top honors. One must remember that the Mr. Olympia competitors are the best physiques in the world. By reaching the top in any sport, one develops a following of fans as well as detractors. Franco's victory was so shocking to some only because he has not been in the limelight during the past several years. There was a displacement of feelings due to Franco's emergence from retirement as opposed to an emergence from the cover of a magazine. This previously made point should reassure those who are not constantly featured in bodybuilding journals that there is still a chance to win. This is in direct contrast to the accusations that unnamed magazines and their publishers use their contracted bodybuilders to win all contests. Reviewing the scoring of this year's Olympia is quite revealing. Franco's total cumulative score placed him in first place. His scores were the most consistent of all the competitors. It's almost as though the other competitors knocked each other out of first place. No individual could honestly state that any one of the competitors were without a flaw. This contest would have been so-called controversial, even if Calendar, Platts, or Dickerson won. That's how varied the opinions were. Unfortunately, the sport of bodybuilding is the only suffering party from all these accusations, the sport was once a sideshow and has become an internationally known happening. To avoid sending this once growing sport back to, into its shell, the basics of the sport should be reviewed. The idea behind bodybuilding is to develop one's physical and mental being for his individual gains, not for monetary rewards. If this is kept in mind, the sport of bodybuilding will once again begin to grow. <laughs> All right, that was interesting. I don't agree with Joe Tricoli. 
he seemed to say that if you, every competitor had their fault and that if any guy, other guy would have won, the audience would have booed the same way. And that is definitely not the case. I was there and believe me, the booing was because Franco was placed first instead of fifth and everybody else was placed lower because I remember the booing started uh, when Danny took fifth. But they, they do make a couple of interesting points. Both articles said how Danny's presentation wasn't matched up to his physique. And I agree with that totally. Um, people who only see pictures of Mr. Olympia would have had Danny in first. But I was there and I would have had Danny in third because I just felt like his presence and his pose, not just his posing, but just his overall presence on stage was like, as the one guy said, he didn't kind of like he didn't believe in himself. He didn't pose like his physique showed. And uh, that's why I would have had him in third. I thought Platts and Calendar were much more aggressive. And I thought Platts was the guy with the charisma. And he should have won. And I think most of the audience would have agreed with that. And then, like I said before, I think Dickerson was fourth. And Franco was definitely fifth. So uh, I don't agree with that last article at all. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed these uh, trips down memory lane, talking about the two most controversial Mr. Olympia contest ever. A couple different viewpoints from Muscle Digest and from Muscle Mag International about the 1980 Olympia and the 1981 Olympia. So we will see you guys next week in the new year, 2024, where we will have more shows for the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. Until then, and train hard, stay safe, and we'll see you guys next week. Take care.